Romans 13, 1 to 7. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do good, and you'll have its approval. For government is God's servant to you for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant and an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's public servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls. Respect to those you owe respect, and honour to those you owe honour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, there's a sermon outline there. Uh, it's fairly fulsome on the inside of the newsletter. Uh, household questions on the top right. Uh, the Bible studies that were handed out at the door are looking forward to the next sermon series, which Ben will kick off. Uh, next week, uh, Real Jesus, that'll go for five weeks. Uh, if you don't catch everything in the sermon, uh, give thanks to God for technology and the ability of those who can use it uh, because the sermon will be uploaded probably by tomorrow evening and you can listen to it again. But there will be an opportunity, God willing, for question time at the end. Uh, there are five major conflicts or wars in the world at the moment that have caused 10,000 or more deaths in the last 12 months. Uh, those wars range from Asia to Africa up to Europe. Uh, there are countless other ethnic internal civil war conflicts that are causing thousands of deaths daily and uncounted suffering. Uh, there are three major famines in the world at the moment and there are places of significant natural disaster throughout the world, not least on our east coast. Uh, in England... Uh, the Prime Minister has been charged for breaking lockdown laws with private parties. Uh, in Russia, there are new laws restricting freedom of speech and which books are allowed to be sold. In China, whole cities are being shut down and whole ethnic populations are under surveillance, even with cameras on their doorways. That's a snapshot of what's happening in the world at the moment. In Australia, we're coming up to a federal election, and I only chose this topic last October, so don't worry about that. As we look at the federal election, the media says one possible leader is on the nose, the other possible leader nobody knows. Our states have dealt with COVID in different ways and largely in competition. Minor parties are proliferating, and they see an opportunity to take advantage of political tiredness and cynicism. If you haven't noticed, living costs are rising, fuel costs are greater than most of us have experienced, house prices are spiralling, and then there's all the debate about gender fluidity, the nature of marriage, the place of ethnic groups, what to do with remote Indigenous communities, and the nature of start of life and end of life decisions. All that is in a nation where 20% of the households earn 48% of the income and the bottom 20% of the households earn 4% of the income. And yet we sit here today, we've enjoyed a great show, we've got freedom to read our Bibles, we can meet like this and we're going to change government with a ballot and not a bullet. Wherever you look, the state of our world is both beautiful and broken, isn't it? It's dazzling and it's puzzling. It's delightful and it's incredibly distressing. We live in a world where politics, money, ethics and numerous other issues intersect in a way that incredibly confront us and mightily confuse us. So how are we going to live as God's people? That's the topic over this sermon series. Let's pray. Our Father, thanks for this world. 
Uh, it is broken. It's your world, and we broke it. Uh, we sit under your judgment in this world. We know that in Romans chapter 1. But there is so much that's beautiful. Sunrises, rain, community. Our Father, as we live as your people in this world, which is so confronting, confusing, and beautiful at the same time, help us to hear your word. Please apply it to us by your mercy. Amen. Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. That's a very clear statement from God about how to live in such a world. They're two of my favourite verses in the Bible. And at the heart of them are God's mercies. When you look at the book of Romans, that's really a summary of chapters 1 to 11. God's mercy. Here's God's mercy in simple terms. God loves his broken world. So he sent his one boy, Jesus Christ, to live the life we couldn't live. So he would die the death we deserved and rise victorious, showing that our sin had been paid for and that we could be reconciled to God. That's God's mercy. It's God's grace. What God gives to people who say, I'm God and you're not. God gives to them because he loves them what they don't deserve and says, you can be my mob and trust in Jesus. And because of God's mercies, Galatians 5, we're completely transformed. Ephesians 2, we're forgiven and saved. Uh, Philippians 3.20, we're given citizenship in God's kingdom. Ephesians 2.15, we're made a new people. Colossians 1, we're given a new postcode. Colossians 3, we're remade in the image of God and our life is hidden with him. Jeremiah 31, we've got brand new hearts. 1 Peter 2, we're God's mob. Because of God's mercy in Jesus Christ. And so God's mob give God what he deserves. Did you notice that in Romans 12? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your logical worship. Give to God what he deserves, the life he has granted you. And so the life of God's people is completely shaped by this thing called God's mercy, by a king who sits on the throne, by the new citizenship they've given. Their minds are changed, their hearts are new, and in this world they are a completely distinctive community. That's how you live in this world, in a world that's so confusing, completely changed by God's grace. So in this three-part sermon series, we're going to look at what that looks like in the nitty-gritty. Christ and crown, that's today. Jesus and politics. Then we're going to look at Christ and cash. What do Christians think about money? And then we're going to look at Christ and conscience. How are we going to make ethical decisions in life? Uh, The sermon series is going to be scattered throughout the term because of the way the term is structured. And the Bible studies will be handed out the week before. But the foundation is Romans 12, 1 to 2. And so you'll see everywhere while we're doing it, and the Bible study handed out last week, that's our memory verse, Romans 12, 1 to 2. And let me tell you, uh, you can learn it. I learned it in 1993. 1993 on my first ever beach mission, and it's still with me today. So let me encourage you to learn Romans 12, 1 to 2. But let's turn to politics because you shouldn't mix religion and politics, but we are. Let me start with a quick definition of politics. Politics is the organisation, distribution and exercise of power. Politics is the organisation, distribution and exercise of power. Now, that's really broad. But when you think about it, that covers so much of our lives, doesn't it? It covers local politics through to the local show society, doesn't it? It covers the rugby club through to parish council. Uh, It covers Narrabri Junior Soccer through to national water management. But when I say politics to you, what do you naturally think of? 
You naturally think of the people we vote on, don't you? That's where we naturally go, even though politics is part of every part of our lives. Oh, when we think of politics, we think about how we're governed, who makes the laws, who represents us, how the laws are applied, who runs our communities. Now, in Australia, we are immensely privileged, aren't we? Uh, when you think about the coming federal election, it's no mistake that we have the privilege of changing, as I said earlier, by a ballot and not a bullet. That's pretty rare in our world. We have a system of government in a democracy that goes each individual has a say and a vote. And we have a system that separates our powers so that there is no abuse, dictatorship and despot, at least technically and really in reality. We have a political system that works at three levels. And we've got local government. They make sure our garbage is collected, to put it simply. We've got a state government, which makes sure we put buildings in the right place, to put it simply. We've got a federal government that runs the whole country and negotiates those three levels. So even though we're privileged, it's pretty complex, isn't it? <laughs> when you mix all of those in. And when you step back and look at the state of the world, which is what I did briefly there at the introduction, it, it's pretty bleak, isn't it? When you look at all of those statistics and then you work your way down. In fact, it can be so bleak and broken that it's overwhelming. <laughs> but, but I want to begin by actually presenting another view of the state of the world. And it's the state of the world that God reveals in his word. And we need to keep hold of this state of the world. If you like, this is our basic set of building blocks for dealing with politics. And there are three parts to it. Uh, in this world, and this is the first part, there is one king, isn't there? There's one boss. There's one ruler. And what's his name? His name is Jesus. That's why Psalm 2 is so important. Psalm 2 talks about God's promise to put his king on a throne. If you listen carefully as Andrew and Max read it, that king in Psalm 2 has no rival. That king exercises judgment over the whole universe. And that king says, if you're broken, come to me for refuge. That's a pretty unique king in our world, isn't it? And when that king is enthroned, there is great hope in the universe. Because most of the universe does Psalm 2, 1 to 2, don't they? In fact, every human does. What, what, what does every human do? I, I want to sit on that throne. I'm going to shake my fist at you, Jesus. I'm going to be the boss. And look how good we've made it. You see, if we get the wrong state of the world... We get overwhelmed by its brokenness, don't we? And so we need to keep this in mind. And God actually does as he promised. When Jesus is baptised, who speaks? Matthew 3, 17, this is my boy. I delight in him. And when Jesus is transfigured, who speaks? Matthew 17, 5, this is my boy. Listen to him. And when Jesus is raised from the dead and sends his mob out into the world to say there's a king in the world, how many rivals does he have? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of every nation, and I'll be with you until the end of the age. There's one king. His name is Jesus. He has no rival, and he gives refuge to those who are broken. Well, if he's the king, and this is our second building block, if he's the king, then how do we deal with him? How do we respond to him? Well, it's a question that came up in that second reading uh, in Matthew 22. Uh, Jesus is in the last week of his life. He's in the temple in his house, remember that? And the religious authorities attack him. If you've got your Bibles there, open it up, page 877. And as they attack Jesus, uh, they organise themselves in different coalitions uh, Pharisees and Herodians come to question Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 15. It's the religious and political elite. They attack him in his own, in his own palace. And when they come, verse 17, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? 
Don't tell me you haven't asked that question. Jesus knows their motives. Their motives are malicious. He acknowledges them. He says, you're a bunch of actors. And then he asks them a very simple question in verse 20. Whose image and inscription is this as he holds up a coin? A really important question. Because the word image is used in which part of the Bible first? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make man in our image, male and female, let us create them. Well, the image on the coin is whose image? It's Caesar's. And Jesus gives that memorable answer, verse 21. Therefore, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Caesar's image is on little metal discs. So give them back to him. God's image is on us. So how do you deal with the king? Give him what he deserves. Give him what bears his image. Give him yourself. And in a world where Jesus is the one king, that king actually lived, died and rose so that we could be made right to give ourselves back to him. He actually purifies the currency of his kingdom so that these things that bear the image of Jesus are actually finally acceptable to him. And it's undeserving. And they can go back to him. There are some who won't do that. We've met them in Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, haven't we? And that king will crush them in the end. They will be destroyed. Jesus reveals his deep and right concern for the world he made. And his concern isn't for little metal discs. His concern is for human beings who are made in his image. Let let Caesar trade in metal discs. God deals in humans. And we need to keep that straight. So there's our first two building blocks. There's a king and he deserves us. If that's the case, what's our third building block? Because you've got to get the messaging straight. One of the things you'll notice in the federal election campaign in the media is all the debate about the message, getting the message straight, keeping it simple. The message of God's king is incredibly simple. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4, verses 13 to 22. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Because God's People have always got to get this message straight. And the early disciples had it straight and they were fearless about it. Uh, They've been going around telling people about this king, who he is and what he's done. Uh, Peter and John are told to stop doing that. And and in Acts chapter 4 verse 20, what do they say? We are unable to stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. Uh, Let me be very clear. That's not a political statement. They're not talking to the political authorities. They're talking to the leaders of their church, so to speak. It's an all-of-life statement, which makes it much more important, doesn't it? And the message is clear. There is a king. His name is Jesus. He rules the world, and everyone needs to know. (laughs) That's the political message of this king. And it's all of life in its compass. Here are the three building blocks for dealing with politics. The state of the world, if you like. Jesus is king. Every human must deal with that truth by giving back to him what he deserves and the whole world needs to know. Well, that's the state of the world we know. That's not much help when it comes to May 21, is it, really? Thank you for telling us that, Bernard. That's not really going to help me as I deal with politics. I think it will, though, because it's really important to notice that as Jesus sends his disciples out with these three building blocks at the end of Matthew's gospel, he doesn't cut his ties with the world, does he? I'm with you until the end of the age. I'm still here, guys. I'm with you. And not only is he with his people, he sends his people out with these three building blocks. 
And as we see them live in the rest of the New Testament, we get glimpses of what it looks like in the nitty gritty. And we're going to turn to that now. So turn with me to Romans chapter 13. I'm at point four on the outline. Romans chapter 13, one to seven. That reading I had earlier on page 1007. As we deal with the nitty gritty in the world, we've got to notice that God has a very clear design. Listen to verse one. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. God establishes every political authority. God has a very clear design for them. I want you to look at verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do good, you'll have its approval. For government is God's servant to you for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Government is God's servant. Did you notice that repeated twice? It has very clear limits. It has no eternal authority. In Romans 13, 1 to 7, you need to notice that governments are temporary. They're put here in a broken world, to bring temporary order as God's servants. They have very clear limits. They have no eternal responsibility. And as God places them, he has a very clear design for his people. The design is there in verse 1 and verse 5, therefore you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. God has a clear design. He has put political authorities there for a temporary role as his servants and he commands, and the Greek is very clear, he commands his people to obey them. But I want you to notice a couple of very important truths. First, what's the political system Paul is writing under? It's the Roman Empire, isn't it? And can I tell you, there is no more centralised and bloodthirsty regime that's really existed in human history. We like to think we do better at it, but that's just because our technology's improved. They are the most centralised political dictatorship the world had ever seen. And into that context, what does God say? I've put them there. They've got a job. Obey them. That's quite an interesting statement on context, isn't it? They haven't yet started active persecution, but they will very soon under Nero. Their policy is very clear that you are loyal to Rome and its emperor and the emperor is the son of God. And what does God speak into that context? I put them there. They've got a job. Please obey them. The obedience is in the context of their limits, and they've got no eternal authority, though they have aspirations, don't they? They'll often try and push against and try and break what God has said. Human sin will always corrupt the structures that God has put in place. And that's what happens with Rome, doesn't it? They seek to be eternal. Remember Psalm 2? Where's Rome now? It's in your history books. You see, when a political authority seeks to push against the design of God, God's king does exactly what he says. He judges them. Now, at this point, we can start to see how our big picture, those three building blocks, are really helpful. There is a king. He's above Rome. He's got eternal authority, not Rome. But what do we do? We obey that king by obeying the structures that God has put in place. And we remind those authorities of their limits, don't we? Well, God also has a clear desire that goes with his design. Uh, Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you've got a page number, yell it out, please, from the Pew Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul is writing to Timothy. He's talking to Timothy about how to set God's people straight in Ephesus. As he does, he writes to him some very important things. Behind them are those three building blocks. God's king is enthroned above all. He's got no rivals. 
but he provides refuge for the broken. As we look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, what kind of people are God's people meant to be in verse 1? They're meant to be a praying people. They're meant to be a praying people. First of all, make sure, Timothy, that God's mob are prayers. And they pray for everyone in verse 1. But notice who that includes in verse 2. For kings and all those who are in authority. God's people are prayers. We pray for everyone, including those in authority. But did you notice, as you go a little further, if you've done the Bible study this week, why they pray? Look at verse 2. For kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity, this is good. And it pleases God, our Saviour, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's what's God's desire? Pray for the rulers so you can lead a life that tells people about Jesus. Pray that those rulers establish a society in which you can lead a godly life that puts Jesus in front of others. That's God's desire, that people meet the King and are changed and transformed, and it reaches into every part of the world. There's no limits for where those prayers go. The desire of God is for people to meet his king. The desire for God here is not for democracy or monarchy or dictatorship. The desire for God here is not for comfort and freedom and an expanding GDP. Let me be so bold to say that the desire for God here is not even for a robust Judeo-Christian state with viable Christian political parties. The desire of God is for political rulers to govern in such a way that his mob can lead lives that get the message out. And that's what we're to pray. And that can happen in any political system, can't it? In any part of the world. And so the picture we have of the state of the world, those three building blocks, encourages us to such prayerfulness because we know the king. We know he's got no rival and we know how good it is to be dependent upon him. So God has a clear design. God has a clear desire. And God has clear expectations of his people. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. A couple more pages towards the back of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2. God has made a people for himself. as people like us. 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10, one of our old memory verses. Once you are not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you're in darkness, now you're in light. Once you are your own boss, now you've got a job. Represent God to the world. And in that context, look at verse 12. Conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles, so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in a day of visitation. Christians had a terrible reputation because Christians were citizens of another kingdom. They had another king. That was terrible in Rome. They were evil. And God is saying, as you serve me, under the slander of being regarded as traitors, live such good lives that no one slanders Jesus as king. That means when you look at verse 13, You are to be obedient. Submit to every human institution because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors as those who those sent out by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. For it is God's will that you, by doing good, silence the ignorance of foolish people. The conduct of God's people needs to be of such a standard that Jesus will never be slandered as king. You see, Christians were starting to abuse their freedom. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, so I don't have to pay any attention to the king here on earth. Jesus is going to forgive all of my sins, so I've I've got a blank check to flaunt any law because I'm loyal to Jesus. And Peter is saying, no. No, conduct yourselves in such a way here in the place where God has left you, 
so that no one slanders Jesus. Conduct yourselves in such a way that you will honour Jesus as king. And that means, look at verse 17, honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. Again, we're not operating in some democratically elected three-year term government. We're operating under Rome where you had to swear allegiance to the emperor as the son of God. And what are we to do with the emperor there in verse 7 8? Did you notice? Honour him. Honour him. Now, uh, let me tell you, that's a very big statement that covers everything from your political debate right through to how you talk about the political authorities. It covers everything you say in public as well as online. It covers every discussion you have in public as well as in private. It covers every term that you use, seriously or flippantly, honour the emperor. But in case you think God's gone too far here, notice what you've got to do with God in that verse. You've got to fear him. Notice the balance. Fear the king that God has established and in fearing him, honour that bloke he's put over there for a temporary reason. Here's the nitty-gritty of life as God's people. Here's the application in three Bible passages of those three building blocks. There's a king. He deserves our lives. Tell the world. This is what it looks like. That's been helpful, hasn't it? Well, I actually think we can go a little further. Let's go to the last point, so what? I want to finish with three so what's. And then if you've got questions, we'll see how we go. As we look at the state of the world, don't be overwhelmed. God's revealed the state of the world, hasn't he? There's a king. His name is Jesus. That king receives us because he actually makes us acceptable to himself and the world has to know it. Hold on to that view of the state of the world. Secondly, as we make decisions in politics, remember the question Jesus asked. Whose image is on this coin? And remember the limits imposed by God. That will actually help us think through policies. If we think through policies that are presented with those two in mind, the image of God and the limits that God has imposed, that will affect everything that we think about from tax policy to the NDIS. It will affect how we view refugees and marriage. It will influence our stance on euthanasia and abortion. It'll change how we view employment strategies right through to how we define what a voter is and what a human is. It will influence how we view policies on the environment, health and education. And then it will help us respond wisely to our political leaders, reminding them in our democracies, dictatorships and monarchies that God has put them there with a limit and there's already a king on the eternal throne. God's image and the limits that he imposes. There are two ways to think about policies as we come to vote. Thirdly, as we think about politics, we'll talk about it, seriously or flippantly. And our language is to be language of honouring, isn't it? We fear God and so we honour the emperor. There is a broad scope for Christians to disagree politically and to vote differently, to be thoughtful and wise. But such discussions should always be fearful of our real king and honouring of our temporary leaders as we talk about them and as we talk to each other. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, We've really covered a huge huge amount of the Bible today uh, in different places. Uh, But thank you for your view of the state of the world. Father, you've put your king there. He's your boy. And he rules with no rival, even over death. Our Father, you've given him power to judge and to give refuge. Our Father, you've given him 
the great ability to transform us so that we can be acceptable to him and give him what he deserves. And, Father, you've given his mob a message to take to the world. There's a king and he is powerful and good. Father, as we interact with various things in our world, help us to fear the king and to display our citizenship in the way that we live. Amen. Any questions? <laughs> Trinda, can I just be clear? I won't cover every question probably because there might be a few, but I'll try to, and then if we go too long, we'll head out to morning too. I don't quite get uh, how image of God and limits. You basically say but they didn't accept me. Yep. So Drinda's, Drinda's picking up on the second so what, which is as we come to think about policies and political parties and politics, here are two basic categories to think in. How does this affect the image of God in our world? Basically, how does it affect humans? And secondly, how is this an expression within the limits that God has imposed? Is this policy looking to be an eternal thing? Or does it recognise its limits in a temporary world? So let me let me pick uh, something very uh, very simple. Okay, uh, le- let's pick the way that we treat people, either with disabilities or at the start of life or the end of life. First question we've got to ask is how is this policy upholding the image of God in the world? Because that's what God's interested in, isn't it? The image of God. And so when we get to policies to do with those with disabilities, they bear the image of God. They're broken, just like the rest of us. They bear the image of God. So how does this policy uphold that image in a temporary world? When we come to issues of abortion or euthanasia, start of life and end of life, how does this policy uphold where the image of God is and who has eternal authority over it? So, Drinda, does that make that a little clearer? And that will actually then affect all sorts of other things. That How you view those three will then affect your view on tax policy. Does our tax policy say that the rich people have more of an image of God on them than the poor people? Sometimes our policies might say that. How do our welfare policies express the image of God? And so if you actually sit down and think about it, the image of God is very useful for looking at every policy. Okay, And then you can go over and go, well, does, are they overstepping their mark here and taking on an eternal role when they're only temporary? Okay, is the political authority going, actually, I'm God, and I'm going to make that decision? Classic example from history is Nazi Germany, isn't it? The thousand-year Reich that was going to exist forever that said that ethnic group, because of the colour of their blood, does not deserve to live. So we're going to exterminate them. That's an eternal job, isn't it? Where a temporary political authority has gone, I'm God. And I'm going to step into that realm. And so that's what I mean about the limits. Does that make sense, Trinda? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it is something that we need to think about really carefully. And it's actually trying to use biblical categories to think about it. Image of God and Romans 13 limits. Any other questions? Andrew up the front here. I'm just following on from your nuts journey. In the late 30s, before it got really terrible, um, Gobel said, I don't think he's great, Romans 13, but he said, if you don't do anything wrong, you have nothing to fear. Where do you draw the line? Yeah, it's a really interesting. So Andrew's asked a question from Goebbels uh, out, of, um, out of the 1930s. If you don't do anything wrong, uh, you have nothing to fear. Uh, really interesting question. And, and let me just flag, my honest thesis was on the way in which the Nazis used Martin Luther to shore up their regime, um, which was a mix of church and state. I, I think at this point we've got, to, we've got to keep in our brains that there are two levels of good, okay? And I think... Uh, We get a bit of that in 1 Timothy 2 and some of that in Romans 13. And I think it boils down to uh, we are loyal to this bloke who's called Jesus, which means we deal with our political authorities this way. The good in dealing with Jesus is to remind them of their roles, which under Nazi Germany meant that your submission was expressed by being jailed. Okay. That's still submitting to the political authorities, isn't it? because you actually accept their punishment 
as you serve the king. And so I think that would be the pattern that I would use as we navigate those two levels of good. The government will say, this is good, and we'll go, no, hang on, you're overstepping the mark. This is good, okay? And you cannot exterminate an ethnic group. I'm going to proclaim that loudly, publicly, and then I'm going to accept your judgment because I know that God has promised to give me everything I need to be his person. So I think that touches on some of what you're talking about there. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I think a great example today are Christians on the Thai-Burma border and Christians in China, where Christians in China will meet to read the Bible and then will be sent to reprogramming camps and then come out again and keep meet, meeting to read the Bible and then go to the programming camps. And I, I just think they're marvellous. Uh, I still remember. I still remember. Um, there's a, an author who wrote a book called Radical, and he talked about going to a house church in China. Uh, this is off script. Uh, a house church in China, and that the church met in a room, closed doors, closed windows, security. Uh, at the end of the meeting, it was all conducted in in complete darkness. At the end of the meetings, they left. He noticed that the floor was wet. He said, oh, why is the floor wet? Uh, that's the tears of the saints as they met. No, that's, that's, that's good. And then some of them were reprogrammed. 